Welcome everybody. I'm Richard Britton and I've been studying the book of Ephesians now for several months and I'm beginning to come up with some things that I think you'll find very helpful. I wanted to start with uh, maybe the first seven verses, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 and uh, I'll read the passage to begin with and then we'll come back and just talk about each verse. We're going to look at some of the spiritual blessings the rich, amazing spiritual blessings that God's provided for us. And I want to look at those carefully and think carefully about what God's given us. Because I'm, if, uh, in my opinion, you know, in my experience, I had no idea what I have received uh, by way of spiritual blessings when I received Christ. I knew some things, but the richness of what's there is far far greater than we can comprehend so I wanted to just go into it and we'll look at it together uh, pray that this helps I'm going to start with uh, verse 1 Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 and I'm using the King James translation Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the Saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul has uh, been introduced to Christ, I guess you could say, in Acts chapter 9. Paul met the resurrected Jesus Christ, the glorified Jesus, uh, as he was traveling along the road to Damascus. He had no intentions of becoming a disciple of Christ. Jesus uh, accosted him, and in uh, Acts chapter 9, uh, the, those first six verses, you can read the account of his conversion experience. Now, when he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he basically fell to the ground and was blinded. He heard his name called out by the Lord, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, Saul responded with, who are you, Lord? Now, at this point, he's referred to as Saul in the Bible. Later, he, he's the same person who, who's known as the Apostle Paul. But here, he's having his first encounter with the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. The other apostles met Jesus prior to his crucifixion, and they learned him in a very human sense. They traveled with him. Uh, they ate together. Uh, they ministered together. And they watched Jesus teach. They, they watched him do the most amazing miracles but they traveled with him prior to his uh, crucifixion. Saul, on the other hand, meets, for his first encounter with Jesus, he meets the risen Christ in all of his glory. And uh, um, this verse 1 in Ephesians 1 uh, states that it is by the will of God that this has occurred. And Paul is appointed as an apostle by the express will of of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So he is specially called and commissioned by the risen Lord himself. He's going to elaborate on the Gospels that we, we've we learned about from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and those are called the Synoptic Gospels. A little bit later, uh, the Gospel of John was written, and then we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's given us 13 letters in the New Testament, he's going to expound upon these truths and help us to understand all kinds of things more deeply, primarily who we are in Christ is being described in Ephesians chapter 1. So it's to the saints uh, which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So it includes you, if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is indeed your Savior. You've been born again, and you're sealed by his Holy Spirit. Your life has been changed radically when you receive Christ. This letter is for you. In verse 2, it states, Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is basically God's unmerited favor and complete peace 
uh, sinners who have never received Christ by faith are in a way at war with God. They are condemned as a result of their sins. They don't have a mediator who's, re who's taken their sins upon himself and taken them away. But the moment a person receives the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, then you're in a whole new world at that point. Christ literally pays the penalty in full for your sins, and you are a beneficiary of God's grace. You are now at peace with God the Father and with God the Son, and uh, this is a gracious act of God. Uh, it's free for the taking to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in, in two verses, we've, we've seen how a person um, can benefit greatly by receiving Christ, just if you have uh, no other benefits but peace with God uh, and, gr and His grace uh, is essentially what all of these gifts are derived from. It's because God is gracious and He wants to bless us and He does so through Jesus Christ. All of the blessings of God come to us when our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without being in Christ, that's a whole another study there. But those who are in Christ, they've received him by faith, can uh, look forward to you now have in real time these blessings. In the future, you'll experience them more fully. So in verse 3 now, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Blessed uh, is, is being, um, God the Father is being blessed by the Apostle Paul as he's writing, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Christ Jesus has blessed us, and so has the Father. They blessed us with all spiritual blessings. These blessings are related to your human spirit. They're much different than temporal blessings like money or a new car, new house, uh, things that are tangible. These are spiritual blessings, things like peace and joy and love. And then there's other aspects of it like life eternal or complete peace with God, complete forgiveness for all the sins. You have no charges pending against you for your sins. Um, God will literally impart to those of us who've received Christ his divine nature. Now, we're partakers of the divine nature, according to Peter. What that means is, is Christ's spirit will unite himself with your spirit, and you will become eternally alive in Christ. The closer you are to Christ Jesus, the more you'll become like him. So we're encouraged by Paul in his other letters to uh, uh, have our minds renewed uh, through through the Word. Be, let us be transformed by the uh, washing, the renewing of your mind through the, the, the words. And, and in Romans and all of the letters of Paul, uh, when you start to study God's Word, there will be an, an, an effect in, in you in the very deepest uh, uh, core of your being. Um, we belong to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to God. And that's a whole different uh, category. Uh, you become filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, the Holy Spirit will begin to prompt us, uh, guide us, uh, lead us, and do things that you'd never even think of. These are some of the advantages of having peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, let's see. Let me go back here just a minute. All righty. The list of spiritual blessings, we'll, we'll unpack them here in just a minute. In verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Uh, believers in Christ, it turns out here in Ephesians 1 verse 4, uh, God chose you in Christ Jesus before the world was founded. And the choosing 
means you're going to be holy. God will see to it that we are holy and we will be without blame. That means um, innocent of all charges of sin and holy means set apart for God's usage. We'll be holy and without blame before him and before him is what counts and this is in love. If a person was lost and helpless and hopeless this is where God steps in. He is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He does it all. We simply trust Him to do these things. We come to Him in simple faith. We trust Him. We cannot save ourselves. We can't keep ourselves saved. We put our trust in Him and He does it all. Now, our lives will change and He, he, he commands us to be obedient. He primarily wants us to love Him. And loving him produces amazing effects in your being. When you love Jesus Christ, uh, he unites himself with you and uh, uh, you become like him. Look at 1 John chapter 1, uh, let's see, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And the apostle John there is promising that when, uh, when the Lord returns, we will be like him and we will see him as he is. Well, this is the result of time with the Lord and his spirit transforming our spirits, but there's a union that occurs, and uh, God has determined to love us. He's going to make us holy and without blame through the spirit of Christ being in us. Well, in verse 5, uh, Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, God didn't simply save us and uh, forgive us for all of our sins and, and uh, arrange for us to never be condemned for our sins. He did far more than that. He didn't just save you and leave you stranded. He literally adopted us uh, to become his very own children. I'm going to go over some things at the end of this uh, first part and just elaborate on some of these blessings. But he adopted us into his family. It's one thing to be saved from condemnation. It's another altogether to enjoy the privileges of being God's child. So he, he did this. It was his good pleasure, his will, and he did this for those who have received Christ. In verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Paul is basically praising and glorifying God because he's been gracious to us, and it was through his grace that he has made us accepted to himself in Christ Jesus. God did not have to do this for us, but he is gracious and loving, and he determined to give his only begotten Son. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not perish, we will have everlasting life, and we'll be holy and blameless throughout the duration. Now in verse 7, in whom, this is in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, or in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Redemption means to have been purchased or bought back. An Old Testament example is Hosea. He, uh, he went to redeem his wayward wife, Gomer, Gomer apparently was unfaithful to Hosea, had children um, by other men, and uh, apparently left Hosea and finds herself uh, about to be sold in a slave market. And Hosea goes and pays the full price for her. He redeems her. I can't imagine what her fate might have been like if her own loving husband had not redeemed her. There's no telling who she would have been sold off to but the, the grace of God was displayed in the love of Hosea for his wife. Um, uh, she 
got in a world of trouble, but uh, at God's command, Hosea went and redeemed his wife. And uh, you and I, if we only understood the predicament we're in, having been sinners, we've been sinning against a holy God who is omnipotent, all-powerful, and sovereign over all, we don't have anything going for us to uh, uh, help us to avoid the consequences of our sin. We don't have any way out. God himself has provided the one and only way for us to be forgiven. That's when we trust in Jesus Christ the Lord and Jesus' death, his uh, shed blood and his death on the cross was uh, the price that was paid to redeem us, to pay the penalty in full for our sins and basically set us free from the consequences for those sins. Well, that's uh, basically a trip through the first seven verses. And I wanted to mention something here that I found uh, fascinating as I began to study. God has so many blessings for us, um, and he seems to choose to do things to manifest himself to mankind. He'll choose a man or a woman, and then he will uh, bless that person with his spirit, and then he'll commission that person to do various uh, things. And I'm going to just use Moses as an example in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, and Exodus chapter 7, verse 17. In Exodus 7, 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. In verse 17, uh, Thus saith the Lord, In this Thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Okay, there's uh, Moses, and there's God. And as you read these passages, uh, when a, an arm is raised to smite the waters, the, the hand has a, a rod in it. God says that's his hand. It's Moses' hand, and it is God's hand at the same time. God is clearly working through Moses to smite this river and turn the waters into blood. And as far as Moses is concerned in verse uh, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, God says to Pharaoh, uh, Moses will be God. I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So, this has caused me to really think about these spiritual blessings. If God chooses us, uh, we, we're blessed with faith in Christ and he grants us repentance from sin, then he chooses to manifest himself through us. There's a union that occurs. And I have been uh, studying this now for 26 years, trying to grasp the fullness, but literally, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ or you could say God, the Holy Spirit, indwells those of us who've received Christ. There's um, manifestations of God. He, he begins to guide us. He'll warn us when we're headed towards sin. He will uh, teach us. He'll answer prayer. He'll instruct us. He'll place you in places that you don't think you could possibly handle, uh, like uh, ministry situations that would be extraordinarily difficult. But if he places you there, he's going to make you uh, over. You'll surely be qualified for the task at hand because it's him working through you to carry these things out. So I just wanted you to take a good look at Exodus 7 verse 1 and Exodus 7 17 and think about how in the world is Moses able to strike a, a river with a rod and cause it to turn to blood? Well, he has the power of God. Why does Moses appear to be God to Pharaoh? Uh, because God made him that way. He, he did that to uh, reveal himself to Pharaoh, to all of us who've read Exodus, and um, he does, that's his chosen means of uh, displaying his power. When uh, uh, the apostles were still alive on the earth, 
they uh, would, like Peter and John, for example, in Acts 2, would go into the temple to pray, uh, or four, I think it is. They would go, and the man was was sick there. He'd been paralyzed for years. And Peter and John uh, basically commanded him in the name of uh, Jesus of Nazareth to rise up and walk. And he did. Well, to all appearances, it looked like Peter and John did that. But Peter and John clearly said, no, we didn't do that. That is Jesus. Jesus said, it's just healed this man. And anytime uh, the Lord Jesus wants to, he can work through one of his uh, uh, believers. He can work through anyone that he wants to, but he chooses to reveal himself through believers primarily because they'll give glory and honor and credit for uh, miraculous uh, occurrences to Jesus Christ the Lord. I know full well I can't heal anybody, but I also know Jesus himself can and, and does sometimes heal through me. He can do anything through his disciples. So look at Moses, look at King David, look at the apostles, and just see, you can see all kinds of examples where people were empowered by God to accomplish amazing things. Stephen was preaching and, and stoned to death, was able to look up and see God. Um, there's uh, all in the book of Acts, you see it over and over. But right now, I'm going to go on with um, the spiritual blessings and just kind of review some of them. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, the Apostle Paul is speaking about spiritual blessings, and these belong to those who trust in Christ Jesus. And uh, I'm going to give a reference verse for some of these. I'll name some of the spiritual blessings in the order of their appearance in Ephesians 1, 1 through 7. And I'm going to give some simple illustrations because spiritual blessings is a little bit vague. I'm going to give some simple illustrations to just help us understand more fully what we actually have in Christ. So let's look at Ephesians 1, 4. We are chosen by God before the foundation of the world. That's worth thinking about. According as he hath chosen us in him, it's always in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Think of the timing there. Before the world was created, God already had chosen those of us who would receive Christ. He chose us that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. I want you to just picture being selected for some kind of a prestigious award and you were selected uh, to receive this reward before you were even born. God himself, in his great love for you, he chose you as a believer in Christ to be part of his family. He did this before the world began. He had the intention of making you holy and blameless and all of this is going to be through Christ. Well, let's look at verse 5, Ephesians 1, verse 5. We're predestined for adoption as God's very own children, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now imagine, this is an illustration to help you visualize what's happened here. Imagine a very loving family, and they have decided in advance to adopt a, a child. They chose this particular child with great, great joy and pleasure. Well, similarly, God himself predestined each believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to be adopted as his children through the work of Jesus Christ. This is an act filled with his pleasure, and it's all his will. God did far more for us than simply saving us from eternal damnation. He has adopted us into his own family. We are now his beloved children, and we now have God as our Father, and the Holy Spirit is in us, and we are partakers of the divine nature. Well, in chapter 1, verse 7, there's redemption through his blood, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Here's an illustration just to make this a little more clear. 
Think about a slave being set free by the payment of a ransom. I used Hosea uh, paying the purchase price for Gomer in a, or a previous illustration, but uh, her plot was terrible to be about to be sold on an auction block. I can't imagine, uh, I mean, you have no, no say over who's going to buy you, and it must have been absolutely horrible to be in that, that predicament. You don't know what someone would do with you once they bought you. Well, her own husband, who loved her dearly, bought her. So think about a slave that has been set completely free by the payment of a ransom. Uh, you don't have to go be a slave. You're free. You just The ransom is paid and you're free. Through Christ's sacrificial death, true believers in Christ are redeemed from the slavery of sin. We do not have to sin anymore. We are forgiven for all the sin we have committed, and uh, we're set free, completely free, and all of this was due to the riches of God's grace. The payment was Christ's shed blood, his death on the cross. God was in Christ, reconciling us to himself, so he made the payment in full. And we are free in Christ, and... Um, we can respond with gratitude and love when we think of what he's done for us and how far he's gone to make this happen. I want to thank you for joining me, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just ask him to help us to grasp some of these blessings that we have. Heavenly Father, I want to sincerely thank you for your grace and your kindness for us. I want to thank you for choosing us before the foundation of the world. You've made us holy. You've made us without blame. You did this for us because you love us. I thank you, Lord, for predestining us to be adopted into your family. I, I just am overwhelmed and amazed by the fact that I am now adopted into your family. And I pray that all my hearers, everyone who's received Christ, will um, meditate on this and, and appropriate these truths for ourselves through faith. Lord, I want to thank you for that adoption and the redemption that we have through the blood of Christ. Lord, our sins are now forgiven, and we've been redeemed. We're set free from the power of sin. Lord, for that, we want to be eternally grateful and praise your holy name. So I want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.